Yankutku and Garuga are some of the most common wyverns in the known world of Monster Hunter, and some of the most frequently hunted. Yet their success, with a broad distribution and regular occupation of arable or productive areas, can often place them in close proximity to man and other wyverns. So what makes these bird wyverns so successful, and how do they fit in with the greater community of their assorted neighbours? So a starting question one may have from the most recent generation of games is why Yangaruga is in the New World, but not Kudku. And this seems likely to be environmental. As to be explored later, Kutku is almost certainly the more specialised insectivore, whereas Garuga is more of a generalist, still frequently taking invertebrates, but clearly being more capable of vertebrate predation, mainly of animals sub-equal to its own body mass. The ancient forest as it stands may not host sufficient densities of large invertebrates to sustain a Kutku population, as it's worth noting, the New World is a much more arid continent than the Old World. The rocky formation separating ancient forest and the world's fire waste functions as a rain shadow, meaning most of the New World's precipitation is focused on the ancient forest. The wild spire is probably the most well-watered desert biome seen in the franchise, but this is all spring-fed, not from any rainfall. The Coral Highlands seemingly receives condensation from water vapour due to its altitude, much like a cloud forest, that then trickles down to feed the Vale. So overall, there's very little rainfall in much of the New World, that receives its groundwater in other ways less conducive to creating good conditions for large numbers of insects. It's worth noting too that as it stands, the ancient forest may well be in a position of being hard carried by the giant trees there, their colossal size and the shade and refugia they provide will likely have significant environmental impacts on the conditions of the overall area, and due to their giant tap roots, they may easily be able to survive on underground aquifers rather than relying on rainfall, thanks to the ecological impact of Rathalos on the various other animals and in turn the plants. The day such giant trees finally do fall, it may well be the last straw of the ancient forest that then may become more of a wooded grassland. It's worth noting too there don't appear to be any insectivores in the ancient forest, and they're pretty rare across the New World too, only Baroth, who is a myomachophage, which is a specialised type of insectivore tailored to high densities of easily locatable insects, engages in this lifestyle in the New World. So in summary, the New World is likely too dry to support the insect communities Kutku requires, and aridity and rainfall are likely very important factors in Kutku ecology. Kutku are described as undergoing occasional booms in population, that are likely to do with rainfall causing a boom in Neoptera numbers for them to eat. For young Kutku dispersing from their parents, this abundance in food can mean the difference in starvation and survival, and so causes these occasional spikes in population. Being born into a year with good rainfall may also have long-term impacts on the life, history and fitness of individual Kutku too. When red foxes disperse from their parents, they're not hugely skilled at catching the rodents and birds that make up the bulk of their diet, and the juveniles eat mainly insects. Years with heavy rainfall make earthworms much more available, and in these years they can form a significant part of the cub diet. The weather-based abundance of food also leads to the cub cohort for that year being larger, fitter individuals that will carry the benefits of search for the rest of their life. So we'd likely see something similar in Kutku. Juvenile Kutku may eat the same food as their parents, more or less, but there may still be foraging strategies to learn for better success, as well as choice foraging patches that mean there's still things to learn through adulthood. Significant increases in food species like conchu, hornitors, banabra, alteroth, and others from rainfall at the right times of year mean there's more for everyone, and such resources take less skill to acquire, and are likely less patchily distributed. So like the foxes, the cohort of kutku dispersing in such years are likely larger, fitter individuals too for the same reasons. The difference between high and low rank individuals is primarily a gameplay feature, with little Watsonian reasoning in-game for the most part. But in some cases, like this one, 
It could be suggested that high or G-rank kutku are the fitter individuals from good rainfall years. This correlation may also have not gone unnoticed by communities that live with kutku as well. In For You, it's mentioned that kutku ears are good luck charms. And indeed, kutku may be associated with good luck, as a lot of them means a good rainfall year for harvests and forage too. Garuga's reputation isn't quite so rosy, and it's often considered thuggish or outright evil. Part of this comes from its difference in morphology. As well as its venomous spiked tail, Garuga also has a sharper bill with more pointed tips, and it's likely that Garuga is an occasional predator of smaller vertebrates. Whilst described as primarily insectivorous, and is seen in game feeding on insect larvae, it's also mentioned to seemingly pursue other prey, and becomes aggressive on seeing the hunter. The New World population is an unstudied and unhunted population, and seeing this aggression may rather be Garuga viewing the hunter as potential prey. Garuga's ears are also proportionally smaller than Kutku's too, and so this may indicate that auditory foraging for invertebrates isn't as important with more of its meals coming from larger vertebrate prey. In carved descriptions, they're mentioned to show a different evolutionary path to Kutku, and this could be of a more predatory nature. Garuga isn't affected by sonic bombs, nor the volume of its own roar that can give Devil Joe inner ear pain. In proportionally loud animals, protecting themselves from deafness is granted by the hair cells in the inner ear being uniquely immune to noise damage. Garuga can grow hair-like filaments with its mane, so maybe there's something similar going on. Or maybe it's like some older theories and it can use the inner ear muscles to shield from the volume. Either way, it could be possible all of this comes at the cost of quality of hearing in Garuga, so it's not as effective in hunting invertebrates. Garuga likely isn't a large prey hunter, and the bulk of its vertebrate prey is likely smaller animals like mosswine, raptorial birdwivens, and kelby, prey it can swallow whole or with minimal processing. This also puts humans in the ideal prey range, and Garuga may be one of the few monsters to actually select for people as prey, so it would be a small wonder it has such a poor reputation from this. A broader diet, including more small animals, probably allows Garuga its somewhat broader range than Kutku in the New World, but the two still compete fiercely. Garuga are seen to attack and displace Kutku on sight, and given the opportunity will even kill them, and this is classic interference competition. Garuga displaces Kutku from productive foraging areas to claim the resources and attempts to reduce their numbers for the same reason. One factor influencing large numbers of Kutku occurring at once could be multiple individuals displaced or preemptively trying to avoid Garuga too. Across much of its range, Garuga is likely the dominant birdwyvern, and the evolutionary divergence evident in its morphology likely makes all the difference here. Competition is present in near all species across the globe, but it's so famous in carnivores due to their habit of killing each other due to it. And this isn't because their competition is more intense, but because they have the physical and behavioural traits for killing that stem from them being predators. Plenty of other species may compete fiercely in less imminently visible or lethal ways. However, in other animals, distance and evolutionary time can overcome universal disadvantages like smaller size, or gift novel tools or traits that can be secondarily used as weapons to dominate competitive interactions within their own families, as we see in birds. And this is likely why Garuga is the big bird. It's already considerably more aggressive, and even if it wasn't already the largest bird wyvern, it may still dominate competitive interactions anyway, with the same tools that permit occasional vertebrate predation that most of the bird wyverns lack. This may also be partially influenced by intraspecific competition too. Garuga are predictably described as disagreeable and combative with their own kind, and it's even suggested in the New World, scarred individuals are ones that have frequently fought with their own kind. Outside of this though, despite its famed aggression and ability to repel hunters, Garuga isn't as keenly equipped for combat against other wyverns. Big game hunting species like Rathalos would have a natural advantage. Garuga's comparatively weak feet and smaller talons force it to use its large beak in combat and predation alike 
and akin to many non-raptor birds that dabble in predation, this limits it to comparatively smaller game. So if Garuga is supposedly on the back foot, why is it described as so nutty, and can be seen to repel even a devil joe? And this behaviour is likely mobbing, the act of making yourself so noisy and annoying that more dangerous animals leave the area. Drongos are a family of bird well known for it, and will readily harass just about everything, but especially larger and more powerful raptors. And really, this matches up pretty well with what we see Garuga do to Devil Joe. The size of the combatant, music, and camera angles make it seem pretty epic, but this isn't so different from most of the mobbing behaviour we see in birds. When faced with this harassment, most larger wyverns likely leave, and to any observers, Garuga looks like quite the hot stuff indeed. The question of why is less clear. One part of it could be Garuga's breeding cycle, or not. And like Drongos, Garuga may just mob continuously throughout the year, but with peaks and troughs depending on whether or not they have young. It could be Garuga's larger size means it can't take advantage of Refugia as well as the smaller Kudku, forcing more of its actions to take place out in the open. It may be worth noting that while still a forest species, Garuga seems to be more associated with more open forested areas, like the lands around Kokoto and the shores of the giant lake close to Dundorma, and absent from the very dense primary rainforest known as the Old Jungle, where Kutku can readily be found. Indeed, Kutku may prefer such areas not only for the high regular insect productivity, but also for the absence of Garuga and protection the dense tree cover affords. The weapon that really makes the difference against Devil Joe is Garuga's tail spikes, used in identical fashion to Rathian. At first it may seem bizarre that two very different wyverns evolved such similar weaponry, but then they may actually be under similar pressures. Whilst Rathian has the powerful feet of the predatory true flying wyverns, her unwillingness to take to the wing means she uses them fairly infrequently compared to other wyverns. Garuga doesn't really even have the option of properly using its feet, outside of copy and pasted turf wars, and so in both cases the evolution of venomous tail barbs present them with a painful weapon that allows them to keep aggressors at bay without engaging in close proximity with the mouth. Whilst both use the backflip when repelling monsters, we do see that Rathian also frequently swings it more normally against aggressors without having to become temporarily volant, and this may be the more common usage. As said way back in the Wrath video, in both cases the venom may be specifically evolved to be incredibly painful, for the specific cause of making aggressive opponents retreat, akin to the suggested evolution of spitting cobra venom. And considering it put off a devil joe, it definitely seems to work well enough. Garuga may have also developed such weaponry as fleeing isn't hugely effective against potential predators. Something the Yans have in common is that they're likely both comparatively poor flyers compared to true flying wyverns, and some other bird wyverns too. Tumblr user Raintree wrote an interesting post on this a while ago that's worth reading, linked in the description. We see that when Garuga chases Kutku on the wing, it's pretty short and not a hugely fast or agile chase that has Kutku return to the ground comparatively quickly and Garuga give up just as fast. Even with Garuga utilising a lot of aerial-based attacks, these are best described as a hop into the sky to facilitate a Kingfisher-like dive bomb, rather than the more aeronautical attacks of something like Rathalos or Legiana. When hunting vertebrate prey, Garuga especially may be a lazy hunter. Much like non-raptor predatory birds such as shrikes, motmots, and kingfishers, it may hunt by lying in wait concealed on perches or in hiding places for something to pass it by, before lunging in a brief aerial strike to try and incapacitate it on impact, dispatching it with shakes and bill strikes if it's not killed initially. So the Yans may be fundamentally ground-living animals that just fly on occasion to get from A to B, and this isn't so uncommon in some birds with similar lifestyles. A good analogue for the yans may be ground hornbills, large volant animals that only rarely use this ability, and for direct transport, more living, moving and foraging along the ground. Kutku especially have a wide variety of insect prey to exploit, and may use a similarly broad range of tactics to feed on them, 
The first scholarly recorded feeding behaviour of Kutku was it using its shovel bill to scoop up grubs in the leaf litter. And for such prey, Kutku's giant ears are essential. Giant ears are often seen in insectivores like various bats, eye eyes and some fox species. These are used directly in foraging, and their hearing is sharp enough to literally hear insect prey buried in a substrate. Just as Kutku likely does the same for grubs munching away in the leaf litter, as well as other invertebrates that may be hiding in there too, like hornitors, or in other environments. In the sandy beaches of the giant lake by Dundorma, this tactic may be used to dig out juvenile hermitors as well, that may form a major part of Kutku diet in such areas. Konju seem to be another favourite, and as well as listening and digging them out, Kutku will also seem to predate them above ground as well. Here we see that Kutku clearly understands that manipulation of its prey makes them easier to consume, and it could be possible it uses this on other prey too. When physically accosted, various toad species will release their toxins to repel attackers, and in some species like Espinas, this isn't a problem, as it sequesters these for its own use. But Kutku may deliberately trigger this, retreat, and then seize the toad to wipe it clean before it can be safely eaten. Ground hornbills will engage in such tactics with slimy prey, like giant land snails or venomous ones like toads. And when eating amphibians, a similar behaviour can be seen in smaller species like southern grey or yellow-billed hornbills too. The bulk of Kutku's diets may be invertebrates, but they may well supplement it occasionally with animals of similar mass to the invertebrates they chiefly feed on. It could also be in breeding season, female Kutku may even scavenge to acquire more calcium from bone for eggshell production. Even species of giant invertebrate can fly, and spend much of their time on the wing, like Vespoids and Bonabras. Their lazy, low-flying and noisy flight likely make them fair game for Kutku as well. And whilst Kutku is a poor flyer, it can still use its powerful legs for swift leaps, and may still be able to catch fleeing insects. Vespoids have a queen, and from this it could be suggested that they may have something akin to a nest or hive too. Depending on the behaviour of the Vespoids on an assaulted hive, Kutku may be able to exploit this. Red-throated Caracaras love wasp larvae, and are pretty sly in how they acquire it. The large social wasp species they like to nest raid provide fierce resistance to anything too close, but abandon their hives if they're destroyed, in a behaviour known as absconding. So the Caracaras fly in and banzai the nest off its support and then quickly flee the scene. They later return once the nest has been abandoned and feast on the larvae and eggs that got left behind. If Vespoid have similar behaviours, then Kutku can use a similar tactic. Get in, destroy the nest, and then run, and then return later for dinner. We know that a Vespoid queen will leave her nest to confront threats in the area that don't leave, so it could well be that if said nest is destroyed, she may well leave to make a new one, considering she's sensitive to threats and a mobile animal unlike a lot of Hymenopteran queens. Kutku's scales may make it immune for the most part to Vespoid stings, but the size of the queen may well give it pause for thought, and lead to a sneakier tactic, over just smashing into the nest like a bear, which is what Espinas may do if it finds a Vespoid nest. With hearing playing a large role in their foraging, and the potential their preferred prey may be more active at night, the ants may also frequently engage in nocturnal activity, Many species that would be hostile or predatory to them, like flying wyverns, would be resting at this period too, and lower temperatures may allow for lots of activity with less heat stress in tropical or subtropical regions. Many insects in our own world are nocturnal, and if anything it seems the bigger question is why the yans would be active in the day rather than the night. It could just be that this is the hunter bias, that most prefer to hunt them in the day as it's when the hunters see better and so most records come from daytime events, or with potentially nocturnal predators or competitors like Astolos and Nagakuga, the threat dilution may not be as successful as hoped. At any rate, the Yans may be cathemeral, which is to say active for short periods at any point over a 24-hour day, with both nocturnal and diurnal activity periods, possibly for different demands. 
Kutku's beak is shaped more like a shovel than anything else, and from how it's used is likely best adapted to softer soils. Compared to something like the pick-like bill of a ground hornbill, it likely can't dig comparatively as deep or in as hard soils. Whilst Kutku doesn't dig or shovel for all of its food, the types of invertebrates it depends on probably share similar demands for vegetation and rainfall. Drought may well be a severe setback for Kutku in the more open and hilly areas of its range, like the lands around Kokoto village, and insectivores are often hard hit by them. The animals they depend on die out themselves, or often retreat further into the soil and can become unreachable and the more arid, sun-baked soil in turn becomes harder to dig into. In aardvarks in our own world, this can result in frequent starvation in drought years, that are only going to become more common with climate change. In Kutku, we may see the same in especially dry years. As well as this, desperate animals may well become a lot more dangerous. Insectivores are still predators, and a high-protein diet of insects can be replaced with a high-protein diet of meat for short periods. Desperate, nutritionally stressed kutku may well attack small animals for food, and even people, and in drought years may well become more dangerous to local settlements than garuga. In drier years, garuga can likely use its sharper bill and greater strength to dig deeper and better utilise buried invertebrates. As well as this, it may prey swap completely to small vertebrate prey like raptorial bird wyverns and bullfango, ultimately having a much better time of things. A response to more regular seasonal changes is migration, and both the yans are described as being migratory in the old world. It seems Kutku are more sensitive to the seasonal changes. Garuga are described as following them, seeming to suggest they only go after the Kutku. As the more obligate insectivores, the Kutku will likely need to follow the rains, or at least wetter conditions to stay healthy. Garuga can likely stick out the colder or dry conditions better, and so leave later. In the ancient forest, Garuga are seemingly sedentary, and this may suggest that in good climactic conditions, the Yans may simply not migrate if they don't need to. So like Legiana, their migrations are presumably eruptive, and so based on food availability. One area Kutku may prefer to stay all year round in, is areas of dense primary rainforest. This is one such area that effectively meets all of Kutku's primary needs, and is likely its realised niche. It has the highest invertebrate production of perhaps anywhere in the known world, for a year-round supply of food. It has few predators, with Nagakuga and Rathian being the only resident ones, and importantly, no Garuga. Kutku here may reach their highest densities, with populations here living in the comparative lap of luxury, producing the largest and healthiest individuals. Kutku may also be important players in ecosystem functioning in such areas too, and their shoveling of the rich, decomposing leaf litter likely aerates the soil, helps biomass decomposition and distributes nutrients. We see such effects in the rootling actions of wild boar whose own bioturbation in woodlands increases species diversity and fixes nitrogen into the soil. So like them, Kutku may not be sponging off ideal circumstances, but actively helping to produce them as well. Even outside of droughts though, both the ends can be dangerous. If the Iceborne book is anything to go by, Garuga are viewed about as favourably as Devil Joe, or other disliked monsters, that may come from their potential habit of eating people. Kutku are viewed with caution, and people are still occasionally attacked. Much like sloth bears, animals in our own world that don't have a predatory relationship with humans, but are still often involved in human-wildlife conflict, this stems directly from the fact that even with farming, wild areas still have resources people in villages require, and people can occasionally be mauled or killed by startled bears when foraging or when bears approach human settlements. Kutku may be the same, and its preference for forested areas may conceal the proximity of both parties until the Kutku reacts in surprise. A lot of Kutku's attacks can't be described as focused. They're often flinging fireballs in every direction, or making drunken charges, or both. Not the actions of a predator intent on killing its prey. Kutku may just react badly to being startled, and the humans lose out. But as mentioned, despite this, Kutku aren't actually hated for it. They're still associated with good luck, 
and cultural beliefs surrounding the species may at least partially pardon them from a bad reputation, and slash all people involved in such incidents can recognise it was an accident. Some quests have hunters collect the resources themselves for villagers, and for smaller villages this may be a significant tactic in reducing human-wildlife conflict, by having trained professionals help with the gathering. Birdwivens are often seemingly intelligent, and despite Kutku's clownish reputation, it's likely the Yans are no exception here. Garuga is intelligent enough to avoid traps when it hasn't been enraged, and this isn't even from observational learning. Unhunted Garuga in the New World also show this caution, and Garuga may be exceptionally neophobic animals that are very cautious of any new tactics displayed by an opponent. In the Old World at least, some of this is from observational learning though. Many Garuga hunted by the player character have had at least one encounter with a hunter trying to kill them before, and so may well have learned a good few of the tricks and traps used that make them difficult to pull off a second time. It's also suggested that Garuga can even learn from other monsters, and the Iceborne book postulates it may watch them and possibly try to copy their attacks. It's not clear if there's any reason why exactly Garuga does this other than to try and make itself a superior combatant, but either way this still shows a potentially significant capacity for rapid learning. Garuga has always been regarded as cunning, but is Kutku? And likely so. Kutku still shows some intelligence. As mentioned, it clearly understands the cause and effects of manipulating Konshu so they enter a easier to eat form. Similarly, a broad range of prey with different tricks to get them requires a lot of memory. It may not have Garuga's array of trap-avoiding behaviours, but this may also be due to it being an easier hunt and less aggressive. As said, Kutku may simply retaliate and flee when accosted. Unlike Garuga, which likely tries to finish hunters it believes it stands a good chance against. So Kutku isn't really dead set on killing the hunter so much as it's just trying to escape the attacks. Kutku are also likely more commonly killed on hunts than Garugas too, and so don't have the opportunity to apply what they may or may not have learned. When you come from an intelligent family with a very smart closest relative, it's more than likely that you're pretty smart yourself. It's just that Kutku don't have as many opportunities to show it off in the context of a fight. Finally, it may be worth adding that in the Iceborne book, there's no mention of Garuga being a brood parasite of Yan Kutku. If we consider this the most up-to-date version of Monster Hunter lore, then this may well just be an old myth. Garuga also don't have a suitable host in the New World either, so clearly even if it did hold some water, they're not obligate brood parasites anyway. As far as I'm concerned, this is case closed. So for my thoughts on the Yans, I think they're great. Kutku is really only a few steps behind Tigrex and the Blosswivens in my favourite monsters. I think he has a classic monster hunter design that's almost as synonymous with the franchise as some of the main returners, and absolutely deserves to be a regular returner itself. Capcom may ineffectually try and replace him every few games, but you really can't cut the cut. I do think Kutku has fair chances to be back in 6, or later games. He's pretty popular, has come back a lot before despite attempted replacements, and gets referenced a lot in the Iceborne book with Garuga, so it's clear he's not just been forgotten by the team. I find it odd that Capcom are so tight-fisted bringing back bird wyverns. The bears and assorted raptors are seemingly viewed and brought back as their respective trios despite being far less varied in their fights and gimmicks than the collection of early game bird wyverns. Why we can't have a trio of Kutku, Karapako and Gypsaros, if he were improved, or any combination of those three plus Hypnocatrice and Kuliyaku, on a rotation instead of just one or two at most is beyond me. Garuga is the flagship who never was, and so I'm fairly confident in him being a semi-regular returner too and is interestingly one of the few people don't seem to moan about. Kutku has a charming and intriguing design, being a weird mix of bird and dragon. With his pink scales and odd proportions, I do believe Kutku was literally designed up from images of plucked or featherless birds, that effectively underwent wyvernification. The face also has some nice patterning to it, almost like a mix of clown and parrot, they make him feel somewhat goofy, but never in an over-the-top or unnatural way. He's endearing the way animals can be. 
The ears have always been one of his signature traits, and were always a good example of what Monster Hunter wanted to do with their designs. They tell you a lot about Kutku that he's a vigilant animal, but also for practical gameplay purposes that they come up when aggressive but go down when he's near death. Kutku's fight was always very solid for Baby's first wyvern. Until his For You Conchu throw, most of his animations later got shared with Gypsaros and others, but he still has some characterful unique ones like his Sonic Bomb stun. In the first two generations he was something of a noob crusher, and no other monster part will be soaked in more first gen hunter blood than Kutku's beak, not even Plesioth's hips. He was truly the first real wall of probably the whole franchise, and one of the best training monsters as a result of it too. He held on to this in Freedom 2 and Unite as well, and made for an interesting combo with Kongalala and the Daimyo. He was definitely the most dangerous still of the pink early game trio. Kongalala and Daimyo were characterised by slow, relatively low damage attacks with big wind-ups and lots of recovery time. And whilst they weren't bad fights, they weren't hugely difficult first time either. Kutku, on the other hand, still delivered high damage attacks pretty quickly, and could swiftly cart you if it managed to corner you. But its relevance faded in later game with little additions in high rank and an uninteresting subspecies, whereas Green Kongalala and Plum Damio were far better. Kutku has some pretty solid early game armour, the high damage option to Damio's high defence option, and whilst he has few weapons, he made up for it with one of the best hammer designs in the franchise, pertaining to the best and truest Monster Hunter weapon design of Monster Piece on a Stick, as it should be. Garuga, on the other hand, wasn't the most fun fight, more annoying than awful with its spamming of constant insta attacks, but it still had some character, with its cunning in avoiding traps. Best described as evil goth kutku, Garuga also never had the most interesting design, but it's also not terrible, could be worse, and is a reasonably good pseudo predatory bird wyvern for now with the base concept for the monster just being Kutku but with a charm and goofiness sandblasted off. However, he only became truly excellent in Iceborne, where he's at his best and is one of the best fights of the Returners easily. With a nice cutscene and some environmental behaviours, he overall made a successful return to 5th gen with his only letdown being copied and pasted Turf Wars, that always felt especially egregious for Garuga. After an impressive showing against Devil Joe, it was a real disappointment to see him get slammed by Rajang, when that was an ideal opportunity to have the two monsters go absolutely sicko mode on each other. His animations and sound design were also improved greatly, Kuku always had a series of squawks and trumpets that did a good job of making him feel very much like a real animal, but Garuga just had differently pitched versions of these. In Iceborne, his new roar and his anemic little croaks and wheezes really fit him. For the monsters that are made too easy or come back bungled, it's important to remember successful updates, and Garuga is absolutely one of them. Let's hope Kutku gets similar devotion soon too. Thanks for watching. And a big thanks to top patron AI Jose for their incredible generosity. As well as Kay Sandum, Erengar Steini, Venomenon, Evely, Howleth, Archazor Queen, and Bazu Gazu Bakuhatsu Bakumatsu for their charity in supporting the channel. A link in the description is provided if you're interested and able to pitch in yourself, as well as to vote on future monster videos. If not, likes, subscriptions, and shares also help a lot and are always appreciated. As usual, the excellent behaviour pieces were provided by Carmen Rider Moten. All the links to their various social medias are provided in the description, so be sure to give them a follow to see more when they're created, as they make plenty outside of just the ones for my video topics. A brief Happy New Year is in order, and I plan for the channel to proceed much as it has before. There's still plenty to cover in and outside of Monster Hunter, with both further ecology and commentary videos to come in future. So thanks to all of you for sticking along for the ride so far, and for all of the positive comments both on the House of the Dragon video, and for the pseudo Wyvern trilogy, now covered at long last. As for who will be next, hopefully this should give you a hint.